as many of you know, my name's Justine Clark. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Parla, and this uh, series, Light at the End of the Tunnel, is a collaboration between Parla and Monash Architecture. So we acknowledge the traditional owners of country across Australia's many nations, and we recognise their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. In particular, we acknowledge the people of the Greater Kulin Nations, who are the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are recording from today, and on which Monash operates. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, and to the Indigenous Australians who are part of the Parla community. So, welcome to number 23 in the Light at the End of the Tunnel series. Um, our events looking at architecture as a profession, discipline and practice and how it is and will be affected by the pandemic and how we can um, influence and shape the world that we will emerge into at the other at the side of the pandemic. Um, today's session is looking at career progression um, and in particular really the role of leaders in advocating for and sponsoring others as part of um, progressing through one's career. We're very fortunate to have Natalie Garlia and Sophie Olson here to offer advice and insight. Um, I'm going to introduce them in just a minute as Naomi is running late, but she will be here soon. Um, but I just want to go through some protocols first. Um, many of you know these, but for those who are joining us for the first time, please do make sure your microphone's on mute unless you're actually speaking. Um, we really like it if you leave your camera on, if you're able to do so. It's really great to have that wonderful mosaic of faces and to have a sense that we are all here together. So these events are informal and informative. Uh, Naomi and I will ask questions throughout and keep things flowing. And of course, we also take questions from the floor throughout too. So if you've got a question, put it into the chat. Um, our colleague Susie will be keeping an eye on those and throwing them, sending them to, Susie, to Naomi and I. We'll choose some questions that you know help progress the conversation and we'll ask you then uh, to put that question live to the speaker. So turn on your, turn on your um, uh, microphone, turn on your camera if it's off and ask your question. If you can't do that, just put that into the chat as well and we can do it for you. Um, Please also add your own observations and comment into the chat. We've had this extraordinary um, kind of parallel conversation that happens in the chat and people often asking and answering each other questions. Um, that's been, that's just a, one of the delights of the series and it also is really helpful to us in informing um, what we might do in future events and future plans for Parlour. So let me introduce our speakers. Um, I'm so happy to have Natalie here with us today. She's an extraordinary source of knowledge and action and a great force for good in the construction industry. And she's a great friend to Parla. Natalie's a postdoctoral fellow in the Australian Human Rights Institute at the Law Faculty at the University of New South Wales. She's got two areas of, of, of research interest. Uh, the first is gender equality in male dominated sectors. And she's done a lot of work in, um, in the construction sector. And secondly, uh, gender violence in sport, and she's a fantastic advocate for human rights in sport. So Natalie recently completed a large research project focused on policy practice and gender equality in the construction industry. Um, and one of the outcomes of that research is uh, an organization called Cultivate, or a, pro a sponsorship program called Cultivate, which focuses on um, company and leader readiness, says my notes, and the advancement of women in male dominated sectors. Um, and Natalie's very familiar with the construction industry because prior to becoming an academic, academic she worked for almost two decades as a construction project manager. Um, so she brings a vast body of uh, knowledge, experience and um, uh, advocacy to, to everything she does. So today we're also very happy to be joined by Sophie Olson and Sophie is um, a participant in the Cultivate Sponsorship Program. So we'll be able to have you know, a couple of perspectives on this idea of sponsorship. Sophie's a statutory and strategic planner. She's got 10 years experience working in consultancy and government. She coordinates multidisciplinary teams to deliver planning, infrastructure and urban development projects in ACT in New South Wales. 
Um, she's been with her current organisation SMEC for four years um, as the ACT in New South Wales planning lead um, and coordinates a team which delivers very wide range of kinds of projects. So welcome Sophie. Thanks for being here Nat. And um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so we can see you all. Look at you all. Great. Hi everyone. Is Naomi here yet? No? No sign of Naomi. Right. <laughs> we'll just keep going. So Natalie, <laughs> let's start with you and this vast amount of research you've done and this extraordinary amount of experience that you've got in trying to um, fix the construction industry. Um, what are the core things, and you know, this is a huge question, so just sort of, you know, headlines. What are the core things that impact women's careers and progression um, that you found through that research and how is that different from the patterns that um, impact on men's careers? And I know we're talking about generalization. So we do about women as a group and men as a group, not men. So yeah. tell, us the, tell us the high level, um, high level things. Okay, thanks so much everybody. I always love being invited to um, participate in parlor events. I feel like you're a bit of a home away from home for someone who can't draw or design. Um, and I just wanted to also start by just acknowledging that um, my research, particularly my PhD research, really builds on that of others. And some of them are on the call today, like Valerie Francis, who has done decades of research in this area. And without her research, the research from Parler and other feminists in this, in this area, you know, it would not be possible for my research to also then um, support theirs and build on theirs. So I'm very thankful. And I, I, I just had a quick squeeze at my PhD because um, I had that pre-webinar um, panic of shit, what am I talking about again? And um, I've just pulled a quote out here sort of saying that um, Valerie Francis concluded that the construction companies for which I was focusing on my research on construction professionals have yet to grant women the permission to lead and to succeed. And it's a nice way to sort of segue into the research that I did, which was really focusing on um, what maintains and perpetuates men's powerfulness and overrepresentation in the construction sector. And I was really fascinated both from a personal perspective of, you know, so many years being the only woman in the room um, working for construction companies, but also spending so long scratching my head working out how it was that I was to navigate this career progression within the construction sector. And because I was an athlete before where I found it um, very crystal clear about how to you know, get onto the metal podium. I knew what I had to do, how the drawer operated. Construction was a real, you know, labyrinth for me. And, and I really struggled to progress my career. So it became one of the foundational questions for me um, in my PhD research, which I will say was sort of the grounding research for um, Cultivate Sponsorship, which I started um, towards the end of my PhD. Um, to your point, um, there is a variety of reasons why women's um, career progression um, is, I guess, stalled and, and barriers exist. Um, and some of them, Justine, really, um, you know, the research has shown extensively, it's been focused on the informality. I think it's a really big issue and the lack of codified um, progression and um, promotion pathways. I would also say um, it's very much shaped around, particularly, and I, I keep saying this because I know that many of you are architects, but within the construction sector, you know, male work norms, as we're increasingly seeing, have a big impact on women's career progression, particularly in terms of, you know, very narrow carved out pathways into leadership. But on the flip side of that, as I'm finding in my research at UNSW, have really terrible detrimental effects on men's wellbeing um, and women's wellbeing in the sector as well. So those male work norms around, you know, presenteeism, total availability, long work hours. But I think also, you know, some of that sort of, um, discursive and you know um, narrative sort of elements around what does a construction leader look like and how you're expected to behave and the enforcement of some of those behaviors um, that are valued in the sector and the other thing i would say is that um you know skills and visibility is a really big issue so um and women not getting that those skills and, and visibility and if you're relying on an informal way to progress your career, well, they're critical because, you know, if there's no sort of 
very detailed academic um, progression process, which I'm experiencing now in academia, then you do really need to have um, to be visible to those who are making decisions, which in the construction sector are predominantly men. So um, to cut to your question, what really interested me in my PhD was when I got to interview senior male leaders and the few female leaders who were pretty much breathing rare air at the top there of some of the construction companies and asked them about how did they progress in their career. And one thing really shone out for me was that whilst everybody in the construction sector works bloody hard, what was a pattern that emerged in um, amongst the men was that they really had formed or been gifted strategic alliances with men within their business, one or two men. And increasingly those men um, often took them within the business. So in terms of how you picked your project teams and you took your project team with you, they or they took them from company to company. And they also guided men in terms of what were critical strategic decision making um, in their careers, for instance, getting on the critical path, um, leading um, trades, say, on the critical path. And then they advocated for these, um, these men, their sponsees, um, when it came to um, speaking to senior leaders. And in lieu of those formal codified processes, these were critical. When I spoke to the few female leaders, what I found was that um, they could actually pinpoint, unlike I found with a lot of the men, they just described it, but didn't actually articulate what was happening in terms of sponsorship. Those women actually could talk about when they were sponsored from X time to X time, what it meant. They were told, you know, you need to be over this, this and this to progress to the next. They were pushed to go for promotion and they were advocated for at a senior level. They had someone up in the decision making tree speaking up on their behalf. And it had an incredible impact on them. One woman said, you know, she stepped into a slipstream of legitimacy for the first time in her career. And um, so it was very interesting just seeing the different dynamics that occur um, within these male leaders, but also female leaders. And I think, you know, to Valerie's um, research, you know, women do, you know, have to spend a lot of time making it on their own because there is that lack of support in the institutions and the structures um, really do act as a barrier to women, um, particularly the informal structures and they're gendered, they're gendered structures. So from that, um, I started um, basically um, looking for other alternatives of way we can sort of shift this within the construction sector. Okay, so that was really very great. Thank you. And one of the, th I suppose one of the things, you know, that I love about what you do is that you take that knowledge and you, you're putting it to work to try and, you know, have quite, create quite practical frameworks to create change, which is obviously also something that we at Parlour really believe in. Um, so can you tell us, um, Sophie, we'll get to you in a minute, but let's just stick with Nat for one moment. Can you just tell us, um, a little bit about this Cultivate Sponsorship Program mm -hmm. and how is sponsorship different to mentoring? Because we get a lot of discussion about how women need mentoring. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, there's also an argument that women are over mentored and under sponsored. But, mm -hmm. but um, what does sponsorship mean in this context? Because I think for many of us, sponsorship is of course, you know, what our parlor partners do. They give us money so we can do things. That's not what you're talking about here. What are you talking about? And um, how is it different to mentoring? Yeah, so um, the Cultivate sponsorship came about by trying to create what was probably an organic relationship that's happening out there um, within business. Um, so we set it up, it's a seven month program. We do an onboarding workshop and um, each fortnight, you know, participants get a information drop and each month they meet with their sponsorship partner. The critical aim with sponsorship and cultivate sponsorship, it's not about fixing women, which I feel like sometimes with mentoring, there's a power differential and there's sort of the information down. Um, this is as much about um, building or you know, rectifying what I found was my first finding of PhD, which was there's a culture of denial and indifference within the construction sector amongst leaders that they had varied understanding and ownership and readiness around gender equality. So the program really aims to um, educate and build that 
that get skin in the game, basically, of senior leaders um, by partnering them with a woman within their organisation. The other thing is, too, the aim really would ideally be, I found women probably um, in construction five years post um, their graduate recruitment or the five years since they started the sector, they kind of said they're in the lost lands. So the other component is to sort of marry up a sponsor in a, you know, a critical level of the business um, with a sponsee and to really help um, those women both um, gain clarity around their career aspirations. And we find that, you know, through sponsorship, um, to particularly it raises people out of I guess the trenches which they're working quite literally in construction to more of a global view the other thing is too that that um, relationship the sponsor then advocates for the sponsee yeah. and um, gives them a greater profile within the business so for the sponsee it's really about helping them to get clear on you know what are, what they want to aspire to, to do and to really leverage off their sponsor and for the sponsor it's really to you know build skin in the game and we have a component where we ask the sponsor to sort of think about their leadership legacy what do they want to be known for in the sector and i think for many of us who've worked in the sector it's fast pace it's short-term focus and so hopefully the program gives a bit of thinking time for leaders and we hope that they um, build their leadership legacy around gender equality so we've had some sponsors who have really championed parental leave for men and women um, and, you know, really starting to step up because otherwise I find it always falls on the shoulders of women, you know, because we're fighting for equality, you know. Um, so that's basically the program in a nutshell. Right. Perfect. Well, Naomi's here. Welcome, Naomi. Very excited to see you there. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm very sorry to be late. I'm extremely flustered. I don't know how a doctor can be half an hour late on the second appointment of the day, but there we are. So sorry, apologies to Sophie and Natalie. But you can just, you know, catch your breath. I'm going to ask Sophie a question and then you can pop up with your insight and thoughtfulness once you've collected your them. Um, so Sophie, um, you uh, you've, you're, you're part of this, um, one, of the, the, one of these sponsorship programs as a sponsee. And I just wonder if you could tell us um, a bit about your experiences of that so far and what it's meant from your perspective. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Justine. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I suppose for me, the sponsorship came at a really interesting point in my career. I, I was on maternity leave last year, on parental leave last year, and I got contacted out of the blue by our CEO when I felt really a bit disconnected from my workplace. And he asked me to put in an expression of interest for our Cultivate program. And it was so nice. It really reminded me of my professional self. And it's been so timely because I essentially thought I would come back. I just had my first child. I'd be coming back to live in no man's land in my career progression for a while thinking, you know, I, there's only so much time I'll have in between having, hopefully having a second child that I may not get the opportunity to progress as quickly um, as other counterparts my age that might not be on the parental leave train. Um, so it came at a really nice time. It was a really big compliment from the organisation and it was a really nice gesture um, that they believed in me and that they thought it was timely for me to start looking um, at my career progression and, and staying in the organisation. Um, so getting onto the program was just a huge compliment. Um, and then COVID hit as the program started, basically. So I, um, I was partnered up with a great mentor in the company. I've got the only other female mentor in our sponsorship program, um, who's a, a really gutsy, powerful, lovely woman um, who also isn't an engineer, which has been <laughs> a critical thing for me not being an engineer in an engineering firm. I, I, really, we, we bounce off each other really well. Um, and it's been great to have space to talk to her and to have time with a senior leader every month to really talk about my values and my goals and my career aspirations and, and really map out a pathway as to how I'm going to progress in the next couple of years and, you know, and, and working parental leave around that because 
it, it, they're based, you know, they're, they're saying that it won't have any impact on my career progression and that's so nice to hear. So from your perspective, how does this differ from, say, a more conventional mentoring program? Um, I suppose I, I had been informally mentored before this. This gives it a lot more structure um, and the fortnightly exercises have been really good. There's some great podcast links um, and article links that really make you start to think um, and start to think a, a bit more strategically about your career progression um, and about your leadership style um, and about just your individual characteristics that will inform your career and, and the way that you, you lead people. Um, I'd been informally mentored before and, and whilst it had been great and really timely, this certainly has a lot more structure to it and I, I believe that this will be a big stepping stone in my career. So Nat, I'm, I'm also, I mean, you know, I'm so interested in the fact that this comes out of your kind of um, scholarly research and this kind of putting it to work and, you know, making it live. And I know you've set up the program in um, partnership with Katrina Tarka, who is, um, who I first met when she was part of the Diversity Council of Australia. So has a kind of more, um, you know, you're the scholar, she's the... She's the employment lawyer. Employment lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I'm, re I'm kind of interested to know how it, it was set up with this great body of um, knowledge behind it. But what surprised you about it as you've, um, as the program, as you've started running these programs across, how many people do you have doing it? I think currently we've got, um, I don't know, six or seven companies. A lot of, we're really working, we've been working with engineering firms, um, utility companies and construction companies. So really hit the male dominated sector quite hard. Um, yeah, so we've had, oh, it's interesting that you even say that. We've probably had a couple of hundred now as our cohort come through. Um, yeah, I guess the things that surprised me at first, um, well, firstly, is the, we've had lots of CEOs through and then absolute nerd burgers. So that's one thing that shocked me because you would think the person who's leading the business is so busy, but um, they seem to be leading the leadership tables um, on the program. But I guess from a um, learning perspective, one thing that really has interested me is that repeatedly we get told from the sponsee that it's give them, given them a global view of the business and it's also given them a view of the variety of roles within an organisation. And I think quite often, you know, we both get told and it's happened to me, but we also, you know, our line managers want to keep us in a certain position. And so we don't, we just, we, we don't see what's beyond. So I think from that perspective, from a company perspective, as well as a um, individual perspective, giving, raising people up to have a global view of the business is really important for, for retention of women, but also progression. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that often um, senior leaders uh, have said that they still saw the woman um, that they're sponsoring as that graduate or cadet 15 years on. Um, so it's really interesting to see, um, you know, that their perspective change. And I also think too, um, I mean, my research, my PhD, I found that, you know, career progression, particularly in the construction sector is really, you know, it's, it's done poorly, if I can be frank. Um, and that's a lot to do with the, you know, the push and shove of the sector and, you know, the short term nature of it. So, um, you know, I, I ideally would hope that um, you wouldn't need a program like Cultivate to sort of embed sponsorship. I would hope that, and we, we, we iterate our program regularly. And so, you know, recently we've added in that, you know, to ask the company, what's your career progression? Do you have a, a template for us to use? And to really prod them in terms of, you know, how does promotion progression happen around here? And both from the, the sponsor and the sponsee, because I think, you know, I, I'm a structuralist, so it's, it's very much around shifting structures. You know, we're, we're going to be a bloody long time doing this if we have to fix one individual at a time um, and the bias of one individual, like we really need to alter the structures. So there's some of the things that, yeah, I guess have surprised me and just even the value that, um, you know, people have shown and, and 
I think the other thing is too, it's okay to do the program and come out at the end and go, actually, I'm really happy with what I'm doing. Um, as well as others saying, no, nah, I, I really want to take a turn here and, and try something else, or I want to go and get PNL experience. And, you know, just feel, I think overwhelmingly the participants feel nurtured by their businesses and that's important. So what, what surprised you, Sophie? Obviously going into it was a great, um, you know, vote of confidence in you, as you said, from your company and, and, and being asked to do it, it sounds like was a surprise to start with. But, but as, the, as you've gone through the program, obviously in pandemic circumstances, um, what surprised you or what's it helped you think about that you might not otherwise have considered? Um, yeah, I, I suppose it's really helped me think about well, giving myself space to think about my career progression um, because I think we just get so busy and actually having some time in my calendar to think about the structure of where I want to go and where do I want to be short term and medium term and long term. And in the program, we actually set those early on um, and then we go and revisit them a couple of months later. And for me, I really, I was setting them kind of six weeks back into the swing of things and feeling, not feeling super confident, feeling like I'd lost my mojo. So to then revisit it a few months later, it was, that was a really big surprise for me because I didn't really, I suppose, give myself um, enough credit for how much having a year off had impacted everything for me. Um, so that, I suppose that was one of my aha moments as Nat and the, the program calls it. Um, the other is, I kind of mentioned it before, but I think I'd always thought as a planner in an engineering firm, there was only so far I could go that um, it, it from, a, from a leadership perspective and a management perspective, that I had a bit of a ceiling um, because I wasn't an engineer. So that's probably been my biggest realisation of the organisation is that you know, there is a future here. I don't have to be an engineer. Great. Naomi, do you want to... Are your thoughts collected? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. My thoughts are collected. And in fact, I have, I have a question for each of you, but maybe I'll just ask Natalie to begin with. Um, I mean, I think this uh, distinction between the mentor and the sponsor is really fascinating. And you've been very articulate and succinct in phrasing that in terms of how mentoring is sometimes about fixing women and sponsorship is really... Um, the sponsor needs to have some skin in the game, as you say. Um, and I wonder about the concept of this, of a, I mean, as someone who has been a sponsor, one, I'm usually quite keenly aware of the, the responsibility that I'm taking then for that person and, uh, and the way that to some extent I'm acting as a kind of guarantor for that person, you know, like I might be opening doors, introducing them to things, putting them on projects, whatever, but um, I'm also sending them out into the world with my imprimatur, mm. which um, I probably only want to do that if I actually know them and think that they're, you know, they're not going to let me down. So I suppose um, it's a poorly formulated question, but um, how can sponsors feel comfortable to do that? How much information do they need? And what happens if they don't have that confidence? Yeah, look, I part of the program and sponsors do need that and they need to actually know the very guts of what's driving that person. And so we go through, as Sophie mentioned, values. Um, we get both of them. There has to be a bit of vulnerability both ways as well. So we get them to sort of do a few exercises where they're both, um, you know, I guess have a light shone on them in terms of, you know, when are they at their best and when do they, you know, when, when at times that they sort of wish that, you know, their peers had thought that they could have handled things a bit differently. We also do a bit of perspective building, drawing on some ethnography methodology. Mm -hmm. um, and so we get them to walk in each other's shoes um, and that's really critical. So really um, to your point, that, that organic sponsorship um, that you probably take has taken a bit of time. You've observed the person, got mm -hmm. to know them, you know, you've, you've had more than a few coffees with them. They don't just drop on your doorstep and go, okay, advocate for me. So right. there is that, you know, the, the program does allow for that um, time to develop. And that's why it's, you know, quite frankly, an eight month program. And even at the end, I mean, we also say that, you know, sometimes 
your sponsor isn't somebody you particularly like. Like I remember one of my sponsors, you know, really lacked emotional intelligence, but he was, you know, he did, he was a good guy and bless his heart. He's passed away, but you know, he, he wouldn't be somebody that I would have chosen to go to dinner with, you know, he, <laughs> Apart from the fact that he sort of rotated um, Granny Smith apples and sausage rolls every day at work. But um, so he's, you know, culinary delights weren't exactly to my taste. But yeah, so that's the other thing. I think that, you know, part of it is also having those honest conversations. And quite frankly, this program is not about this is your step up for promotion in lieu of the codified pr um, processes. So we're really clear about that. It's really is. Um, about also giving the sponsee access to your network. So if you kind of sit there and think, you know, oh, I, don't, I don't know how I can help this person, it might be through your network that you can guide them, you know, as a sponsor. So it's not just you doing the advocacy, it's helping them sort of, um, I guess, you know, build their own network um, within positions of power and um, to help them. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's something there's, and maybe this could be a question for Sophie as well. And it's sort of awkward because it's about the people who don't get that invitation that you were fortunate, but also obviously very deserving to receive. Sophie, you said you were surprised. Um, and obviously others have not received such an invitation. What, I mean, what, what do you say to the people who haven't been picked out, had their value recognized and acknowledged and you know, invited into such a program, what, what can they do? Um, good question. Um, hard one to answer. And, and I suppose one, it, it has been raised by some of my other female colleagues that did put their hand up, it did put in an EOI and didn't get selected. Mm -hmm. And I think it really comes back to that playing it, paying it forward. And um, it, there's, there's so many informal opportunities for sponsorship. I, having the program there is, is amazing, but it's almost, you know, giving, giving our other female colleagues a, a step up and an introduction to the people that you've been introduced to or the network that you've been introduced to. So I've certainly been more attuned to doing that sort of thing with the other women that haven't been selected, um, trying to make sure that they're included on on projects or um, in, in certain meetings that they get taken along to things and suggesting that there's, you know, an informal opportunity for them to grow their network further. I don't know whether that really answers your question, but... Well, it's sort, of an, it's yeah. sort of an unanswerable question, really, isn't it? But I guess, <laughs> you know, to be selected for such a program, someone has to see something in you. Someone has to recognise your value. And that's enormously, you know, we all need that. We all need to feel valued and that our qualities are seen and um, thought to be good. Um, but I guess it's, you know, it's an impossible question to ask because you can't, you know, just kind of show your qualities better necessarily. Um, mm. But I wonder if we might go to Net uh, the Nettleton Posse in Brisbane have a question about... Um, tips for pairing sponsors with sponsees. I think that's a question for you, Nat. Yeah, look, um, I mean, within our, when we run the program, we do give tips, but um, I am, and we sort of help um, the companies, you know, find that sort of blend. But I think the thing is to, one thing not to do is put the sponsee with their direct line manager. Um, that's just, <laughs> and you often want to have sponsors that are a few grades higher than um, the sponsee, um, both in terms of giving access to, you know, different parts of the business and a different perspective on the business. Um, and the other thing is too, to think outside the square. Like I, I often feel like traditionally, particularly with mentors, you know, I know with myself when I was at Leighton, they gave me a project manager who was on my site and um, I was the project engineer to so really actually, if I had done that again, to ask the participants, the sponsees, and even um, the sponsees what sort of um, access they would like. I would have liked to have gone into business development or something like that, and then to sort of secure some um, sponsors, you know, that you know you normally wouldn't have contact with. And I know that's sort of a big industry, big company perspective on this. I also think too that um, you know, in terms of pairing them up, it doesn't have to be. Um, you know, it, it can, you can look at people from quite different um, career paths as Sophie has suggested, because part of it is building that sort of, um, I guess, view of 
um, the organisation, the profession from a different perspective. Um, trying to think of some other sponsor related, how to pair them up. I think the other thing is too, um, if you were to start your own sponsorship program within your organisation, you know, go with low hanging fruit first and maybe ask sponsors who are eager to do this, um, you know, so start with your allies first and then, um, you know, build it for an, like maybe do an expression of interest so that you've got people who are willing to put the time in and the effort um, and otherwise strategic alliances within, you know, your business that you know that those people as leaders um, will be, um, you know, great leaders and will be able to, um, you know, guide the program in and, and, and sponsor people within their organisations. Because mm. I think that's one, one thing that I suppose we're very mindful of dealing with um, predominantly architectural practices mm -hmm. as we do is that many of them are small. Yeah. And small in architecture means like three or four or five people. Small in the bigger business world means 100 people, which is big in architecture. So, you know, it's kind of like... Uh, often one of the things we're trying to think about is how we might take some of these lessons and programs that have really been developed for much larger corporate environments mm -hmm. and where the you know how they're relevant mm -hmm. in, in a smaller practice and obviously um you know what you've just been saying now it, it, the kind of rationale is very 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 clear mm -hmm. but when you um do you have any kind of fur any thoughts really about what you how smaller practices or um, uh, even individuals might go around about kind of accessing this kind of knowledge or these kinds of systems or developing them? Yeah, look, I think um, it, we definitely did design them around um, organisations and to be done within organisations. But when I think at, and look at my sponsors that exist often outside of my organisation, you know, I think you can be paired with somebody, even if they were, you know, like Naomi and I could be paired up. She could be sponsoring me because, you know, whilst we're at different universities, you know, we, we follow similar sort of career pathways despite being, you know, outside of, um, you know, not being in the same institutions, you know, we're, we're having to adhere to some of the informal and formal rules already within our profession. So there's a great opportunity there, I think, even within an organisation like Parlour where you, you do match make um, sponsors and sponsees and for those smaller organisations that, you know, um, I think what's really important, as I said before, is to retain women, to give them, you know, that support to progress their careers. And that can be done both within the discipline, but also within an organisation. You know, it's very much around seeing the opportunities there that there's not just a dead end or in, for instance, in construction where you get sidelined into the pink, you know, areas of sort of commercial design, sorry. <laughs> commercial and design but you do in construction companies you know that they just take you off the site and off you go into the head office and um i just wanted to say one thing what also surprised me was um before just to your question was companies um response by putting women who are on parental leave on the course um whilst they're on parental leave and i just think given that in our research we found 50 one company lost 50 percent of women when they went on parental leave and the other company we couldn't find women who had been on parental leave it's ingenious that they actually do support um and really make sure that you know women who and men who are going on parental leave as primary carers or carers um come back and are supported within the business and see a career pathway for them mm -hmm. um jenny hinwood has a good question about career progression and mentorship for sole practitioners. I wonder, we've covered that already a little bit, sole practitioners or mid-career practitioners. Um, do you have anything to add on that, Nat or Sophie? Sorry, what was that again? Sorry, a question from Jenny Hinwood, whose audio is dropping in and out, about yeah. um, career progression and mentorship for sole practitioners and mid-career practitioners. Yeah. Speaking of someone who's left, you're right, okay. I think similarly, you know, with sole practitioners, sponsorship definitely within um, a discipline association like Parlour or like Architects, you know, I don't know, I'm not au fait with your um, membership organisations in architecture, but certainly um, 
particularly within, um, you know, having that support network within those organisations and having those advocates, like in terms of having them be able to speak up for you, to recommend work your way, that type of thing. I think, you know, sponsorship also would be an effective way for sole practitioners. Um, and in terms of mid-level career, I mean, I, I don't think this is just an early career um, something for early career people either. I think that, you know, there's careers are long and, you know, there's lots, there's often a journey to be taken in different directions. So I think that, you know, um, having that um, active um, strategic alliance is critical for everybody. I wonder if we might go to Valerie. Valerie Francis, we're very excited to have you here, a luminary in, in our field. Um, um, <laughs> look at you scuffing away. <laughs> you are, well, I've been scuffing my lunch, actually. That's why. Oh, I'm well. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to, to, to give us your view on the difference between mentoring and sponsorship that you've popped into the chat here? Oh, I just sort of thought it's just good to sort of reflect on sort of how we, um, cap, how we think about mentoring. Because mentoring is, it typically encompasses three different aspects. So it encompasses this psychosocial support, it encompasses role modeling, and then it encompasses career support. So it's the career support that's more closely linked, I feel, with sponsorship. Mm. Uh, and it's also the one that is the one that is a, much more of a predictor of advancement. Um, and I think when, when women are in a really, um, uh, uh, in a position where they're in a, in, in a minority, they're really trying to understand, should they even be there? what's their role, et cetera. So having a role model and having um, um, this psychosocial support, so this emotional support is a really important thing because, so I think we have to realize that mentoring has different purposes. Mm. And one of its biggest purposes, I think for women in construction is it actually keeps women in the industry, but what actually gets them further on is what Natalie's doing, which is looking at the sponsorship and actually um, women often have sponsors who have less organisational clout, so that's, um, you know, that's fairly well written up in the, in the literature. So it's sort of, um, it's really good. It, your program seems absolutely spot on, Natalie. Um, I, I think it's just fantastic because you are basically getting in people who have got organisational clout and you've got women who are, and you're focusing in on this practical career support. Uh, and um, and opening their eyes to what's there that they, they that they're unable to ever get access to otherwise. So it's fantastic. I I absolutely admire what you're doing. Thanks, Val. Yes. <laughs> I think as a as a sponsor as a sponsee, certainly the program because it it, it really broke us broke us all down um, and made everyone really vulnerable. And you shared a lot of really personal things. So. For a lot of the other sponsees in the program, they were able to kind of overcome some of those pitfalls that Valerie spoke to because you did get to really know each other really well and, and know each other's values really well, which you wouldn't ordinarily know, you know, just in the workplace. Mm. Um, there's, there was a fabulous activity, a day in the life activity that we didn't get to run because of COVID properly. We still ran it. But those kind of things where you go and sit in someone else's sit in someone else's seat, wear their shoes for the day, gives you, it just breaks down those, you know, those personal barriers that you'd normally have in the workforce and that you might have in a mentoring relationship. It kind of just takes it to the next level. Mm. That's, it's, I mean, that's something that raises the other kind of interesting outcome of this is also the relationships that get built laterally as well as horizontally. So building those networks with other sponsees, I imagine, is also very potentially very powerful thing that might, you know, be with you for decades. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and just kind of breaking down some of the silos. We're obviously we're in a big organization and, and there's different areas and silos tend to exist unfortunately, but getting um, people in different offices and, and getting to know what they're up to, it's great. It, it gives you more exposure and yeah. it's just all part of the whole networking aspect that kind of came with it. I wanted actually. I wanted to put, go right, go back um, to a comment from Sue Whittenham, um, our friend Sue, um, 
a very good comment uh, saying, Sue, you're saying you get very frustrated when people attribute career success to just being in the right place at the right time. Um, do you want to expand on that a little bit? <laughs> First, I remember hearing um, an interview with David Higgins now, Sir David Higgins, um, talking about how miraculously he had, um, uh, you know, he, his career had unfolded in land lease and in civil and civic. And he was very humble and just said, you know, just he'd never planned anything. He'd never been intentional about it. He just seemed to have been in the right place at the right time. Um, and uh, so was he just lucky? Um, at which point you want to pick him up and shake him because um, clearly he's not just lucky. And if he had insight into this structural alliance model, then he would have realised that he was just with all the A-teams that were progressively moving on and up and, and taking him in that slipstream. So, um, so yes, that initial flash of insight and hearing that there is a logic for trying to identify the right place rather than just look back and go, hey, wasn't I lucky? Mm. It goes to all those, you know, myths around merit too, doesn't it? Mm. They were just so much so clever. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's really frustrating. I mean, I even hear it from some senior women who say I was lucky, it was serendipitous that I got promoted, when actually really, um, you know, there's so much more that goes into progression. And I just wanted to drop on, draw on um, Badru, sorry, Justine, just, you know. Um, but Drew's question here around um, strategic alliances in men, and I think, you know, the overrepresentation of men in the construction sector um, means that there was more opportunities because most of the people in power were men. That said, I do also want to recognise that there are some, some men within the construction sector, and you know, many, I'd suspect, that aren't also sponsored. And, you know, that goes to the very gendered nature of the sector that, you know, uh, sponsors often pick particular types of men to um, to sponsor. And so there are others that are being missed out, are, are missing out because they might not appear or behave in a particular gendered way often, um, and therefore are also missing out. So I, I cannot, whilst it's wonderful to have a sponsorship program, like I, I do stress that, um, you know, codifying processes and having them enforced is really a way uh, through this. And um, whilst people, it was amazing when I was doing my PhD, they, you know, companies were saying, we don't really like policies. Well, the great thing about policies, they're often written on computers and they can, you know, be re-edited and drafted and changed. You know, they're not set in stone. So I, you know, I can't um, stress this enough that, you know, it shouldn't be left to chance how you progress. And clearly in my PhD, when I asked people how progression occurred, there were six different types of ways you could be promoted, but none of them was, I sat down and, you know, I went for a promotion process or I, I knew what the skill set was clearly for the next level. And therefore I achieved that. And um, I'm now being in the university system where it's incredibly codified. So maybe somewhere in the middle, you know, <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that, Nat, actually, in terms of the genderedness of historical modes of sponsorship, which, of course, I can think of two, at least two. One is the master apprentice model, yeah. master obviously being a highly gendered concept, very big in architecture, um, mm. still persists. Um, but also the concept of patronage, um, you know, which has on the one hand uh, the positive connotations of the patron being the kind of champion, but also patronising, of course, as in a hierarchical relationship, but also the patron is always male, you know, the word is gendered. So um, uh, do you think that, that kind of sort of, let's say, tradition of patriarchy is, is, um, is playing into this? Oh, in terms of um, acting against women's progression or shifting. Oh, well, like no, like well, let's say actually, kind of homosocial models of patronage. Let's say. Um, I definitely think homosocial models of patronage are alive and well. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it's very much, um, I guess, one of the issues. And when, as I kept saying, you know, if that's what's, if there's no um, formal process that's enforced then, you know, people will, will refer to that type of homosocial model. And what's really interesting as well is what I found that a lot of younger men sort of knew that that was part of their wheeling and dealing. And I, you know, in terms of getting ahead and um, where I think 
you know, there was a reliance by um, women, and this is not to blame women at all, but a reliance on the formal structures of fairness and equity, um, and that they, they actually weren't being enforced because homosociality was being privileged um, and overlooked. And quite frankly, the other thing that was happening, and this is again a big organisation thing, is that the power laid with operations managers who they themselves were you know, had been men in construction and that HR had had their power stripped off them. They were very much an administration um, arm of the business. So, you know, it was very, you know, that gendered, you know, homosociality was alive and well within um, the construction companies that I um, studied. So for the non-academics in the room... Yes, yeah, sorry. What's homosociality? It's, you know, the likeness of, you know, selecting somebody who is um, very much you know, alike you in gender and, and privileging that. I mean, probably a really bad definition. I'll have to look it up on my PhD. But, um, yeah, basically promoting those in your gendered likeness and, and you know, having that sort of um, building a network amongst those people and sponsoring, you know, those who look like you. So that in, informal gendered networks, really. Yeah. I just thought I'd, you know. Sorry. <laughs> Great term, though. My fault. Sorry about that. No, no. I mean, I just, I, well, I wasn't sure. Does everyone know what this means or not? So I thought it's good to get it out. Basically, yeah, yeah. you know, supporting those who look who look and behave like you. Um, there's so many great questions here, but I wondered if we could go to April Wilkinson. April, do you want to? I know we're running out of time, but Are you there, April? No, I might have lost April. Okay. It's a good question, though. Yeah, let's put it. So April says, "Have you noticed any substantive differences in candidates developed through a sponsorship program, as against that of the step-up approach of regularly changing employees and seeking mm -hmm. higher-level roles?" And then she expands and says, "I think there's a contrast in the role of sponsorship between private sector and public sector, with public sector roles mostly linked to a grade structure with no." or limited potential for progression within a specific role. Um, do you have anything to, either of you yeah. have anything to say about that? I mean, I mean, the researcher in me would love to do a longitudinal study in relation <laughs> to um, whether, um, I know in the research in the past, and Valerie would know this, you know, that traditionally women would um, move around to get a promotion. Um, Andy Dainty's research on construction professionals details that quite significantly. I think that's slightly changed if I look at Australia because I think people are increasingly shopping around, particularly in construction, for salaries. Um, I don't, I, I can't tell you how, um, you know, for women what it looks like. I can tell you from the research for men that they often went arm in arm that they, they both um, progressed them internally, but if they needed to, they moved around. Valerie's got a hand up, do you? No, no? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, what I saw in my research is that they did, they, they, they went from company to company, but also um, internal, inter, sorry, internal. In terms of private and public sector, um, I think, you know, context is really important. And if, I mean, I, if I think about the university sector, for instance, and professional staff, often there's a ceiling there and there's really poor career progression planning for professional staff. But I also think too that um, depending on what the role is within the public sector, I suspect that the public sector, despite having also those codified um, processes and those very nice clear um, grade structures, that there is strategic alliances in formal sponsorship operating very clearly through that. Um, I know it's happening in the university sector and, you know, um, so I think that, you know, to my point about codifying rules, it, I think that, you know, it is important, but it's not to say that it would eliminate, you know, some of that informal gendered um, networking. I can speak to my experience in, in government versus in consultancy and really I had an informal sponsorship arrangement in government that where I transitioned much faster through my career than in consultancy. I think it just really depends on the organisation and the public sector organisation that you're working in 
and, and finding that person that believes in you regardless of whether you're in public or private. And then if, it, if there's not a sponsorship program that can formalise it, then trying to, to forge something that works and will help you to progress your career that way. That's we are almost out of time. Um, Justine, how should we wrap this up? Well, um, one, you know, when you're not here, I always go overtime, Naomi, but anyway. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, <have you. laughs> um, I mean, there's a few questions here that we haven't responded to uh, for asking about access. Um, Nichelle's asking about um, opportunities for students and, and young graduates to get sponsored out again outside of a kind of um, company program and um, I know this again came up with our mentoring session as well. So the Institute of Architects does have a, a mentoring program. I don't know of any um, sponsorship program that's sort of industry at an industry level rather than at a company level but it sounds like that's something we might be able to talk to Natalie about so um, I know I've been saying Carla's going to try and do something about mentoring for ages and ages and I've never done it um, or we've never done it but uh, maybe Nat and I might have a conversation offline and we might be able to get back to you about some of this um, um, uh, there's just yeah Naomi take it away <laughs> Well, actually, there's some really good comments. Um, Graham has a good comment about um, sponsorship for, for people in small business coming from allied professionals. Um, oh, Fiona yes. Gray's got an excellent um, observation for people in the public sector about secondment, uh, very apposite. But I guess, um, I mean, both sponsors can also be clients. Yes. yes. Precisely. Really important. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess, Nat, if we can finish with um, the question about how people can, you know, actively become involved. But I guess for both of you, do you have any last words about what, you know, what this has done for you? Like, Sophie, I guess it's I guess potentially changed the trajectory of your career, perhaps. Um, and, and Natalie, what, you know, what are your last words? Um, if you'd like more information about Cultivate Sponsorship, check us out on our website. <laughs> Currently, we are working with companies and not individuals, but I will talk to Justine about it. Um, yeah, and it's just, as I said, like, you know, it's not a silver bullet. It's just one of the many ways that we can shift gender equality in um, our professions. I just want to be clear on that. So, um, yeah, Sophie, to you, what, what life-changing? Ah, oh, well... Watch this space, I suppose. But um, yeah, it's come at a really interesting time in my career. So hopefully um, something good will come of it. In the next couple of months. Which, um, definitely been great. Well, thank you both very much. Um, next week, we're returning to this question of flexibility, which has come up again and again. Um, but we've got Brian Clohesy from BVN talking about what they have been doing pre-COVID, which is some really sort of extraordinary um, frameworks to improve flexibility and hopefully we'll also have someone from a smaller practice as well but I haven't yet lined that up um, and we're very excited that Natalie's going to be back again in a few weeks I can't remember exactly when but Natalie will be back with Alison Murrams who is this ex amazing woman who runs a um, uh, set up in a construction company in Sid Sydney where they're really really working to change the culture of the whole industry um, and Natalie has a research works with Alison. Um, so uh, keep your eyes peeled for, for that one that's coming up. Uh, we've got quite a nice little forward um, schedule as we can't believe we're getting towards the end of the year, but there we are. Um, um, we're coming. Thank, thank you very much to our wonderful speakers. Thank you, thank you <laughs> Round of applause. Thanks everybody. Thanks, everyone. And everyone in Victoria, you know, enjoy post-lockdown life. Mm -hmm. I am going out for lunch with some friends for the first time in months and months and months right now. <laughs> so excited. <Enjoy. laughs> See you all. Have a lovely Friday. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Bye.